allihopa, god morgon. Välkomna till vår presentation. <coughs> Men... <Maria. laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Of course, you're not all from Sweden like we are. I will take this in English. Hi everyone and welcome to our presentation on how to score platinum in lead by using experience from energy efficient projects in Sweden. Our ambition for this session is that you will be able to describe the sustainability factors behind Sweden's success in LEED, and also to list energy efficient methods that can be used for more sustainable buildings. We also hope you that, that you will be able to demonstrate positive effects that LEED can have on a new market, such as Sweden, and also that you will be able to make your own projects more sustainable by learning from these solutions that we'll present to you. This is our agenda for these 60 minutes. And we'll soon be done with the introduction, and then we'll give you a brief background on why sustainability is such, uh, why we have so high ambition on sustainability in Sweden and how we're working with LEED. And the main part of the session will be on how to build energy efficient and still have a very good indoor environmental quality. And then we'll sum up in the form of a dummy guide on how to score LEED platinum in lead. Uh, and of course, there will be time for questions in the end. So who are we? Uh, my name is Maria Krillberg. I work at a consulting company named Sveco. Uh, we work in the field of architecture, engineering, and environmental technology. Uh, me, myself, I'm an engineer uh, in the field of socio-technical systems, and I also have a bachelor in business. Uh, Sveco has 9,000 employees, and I've been with Sveco for the last five years. I work with LEED in several different projects. Uh, my biggest one is a hospital, a new university hospital in Stockholm named New Karolinska. And that's one of the biggest building projects in Europe right now. Uh, I also have experience from office projects and data server halls. And side by being a green building consultant, I work with Sweden Green Building Council and I'm on the lead committee there. And with me today, I have Pia and Robin. Mm, thanks. My name is Pia Erling, and I have a very long experience in the building industry. I've worked in the industry for 30 years, and uh, I'm not all that old, but I started when I was 15. <laughs> I started working on my school holidays. I've got a Master of Science in uh, building construction, and I worked as a sustainability consultant for about 20 years. Um, I worked with lo lots of different LEED projects in Sweden since LEED started there in about 19, oh, 2009, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, I've done new construction, I've done core and shell, I've done interior design, and I've done LEED e-bomb projects. Robin. My name is Robin Johnson. I have a Master of Science in Engineering from Uppsala University, uh, specialized in energy systems. Today I work uh, at a consulting company called Bengt Algren with energy modeling. Bengt Algren is a consulting company that specializes in buildings. We focus on HVAC, energy, controls, fire protection, and environment. I've worked in several lead projects, including data centers, offices, hotels, and also hospitals, for example, New Karolinska that Maria mentioned. Finally, for the last two years, I've been the chair of the lead energy work group at the Sweden Green Building Council. Are there any people who's been to Sweden in the audience? Oh, that's oh, a lot. good. <laughs> Hope there will be more to visit Sweden afterwards. And as you heard, we are all engineers. Is there any of you an engineer? A few. It's good to know. So let's get this started. Uh, we want to start with helping you to get to know Sweden a little bit better. Uh, for, you, for those of you who haven't been there, uh, it's quite a small country, and we're up in the northern part of Europe. Uh, we have a map, map there, um, you see the big arrow, but you can't really see Sweden because it's hidden under those green dots. Uh, those green dots symbolize green cities. I'll get back to that picture. 
Many associate Sweden with its beautiful countryside. We have a lot of forests and lakes and a long coast, uh, and those red cottages that you often see in pictures. But today, actually, most people live in cities, and many of those cities are small. Uh, but we have one quite big city, that's Stockholm, our capital. In Stockholm, we live two million people. Since we are up far north, we have four distinct seasons and quite cold winters, but the summers are really nice. Like uh, right now in New Orleans, that, this is uh, summer in Sweden. Yeah, it wouldn't get so much warmer. <laughs> there is a high environmental awareness in Sweden. Um, among other things, we are ranked number one when it comes to consumption of organic food uh, among the EU countries. And we're also good at recycling. We recycle 88% of all our aluminum bottles and PET cans. And there was a recent study uh, from a construction company where they found out that seven out of 10 Swedes would like to live in an eco-labeled house and are actually willing to pay extra for it. Uh, we also have ambitious national political targets on sustainability. And many of the cities are taking those targets even further uh, so I think that's why we have all those green dots there. Um, there are all, almost always uh, a few Swedish cities in the top 10 when they're doing rankings of the most sustainable cities in the world. And this is one example where Stockholm and also the city of Malmö was in the top 10. So a little bit more on building traditions and regulations. I mentioned our cold winters. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we've been very early on focusing on well-insulated houses and to reduce the need for energy for heating in Sweden. And on top of that, we experienced during the 1970s this energy or the oil crisis, and that put an even bigger focus on that we have to reduce the need for energy for heating. And it also made us move away from using fossil fuels like oil uh, in our buildings for heating. So today we don't use oil or gas, almost not at all, in our buildings. I also mentioned our national political targets, and many of those have their origin in EU directives because we're part of the EU. And we have two important directives here when it comes to energy. It's the 202020. What does 202020 mean? <laughs> yes, that's a good question. It's quite tricky to say as well. Uh, it means that we, the year 2020, that we should have reduced our energy use with 20%. We should also have reduced our CO2 emissions with 20%. And we should use 20% more renewables. So that's that one. The other one, near zero energy buildings, that's for the same year, 2020. All new buildings will have to be near zero energy buildings. And that will be what we think that will be is about what we today call passive houses. But it's up to every, every country to actually decide what that's going to be. Uh, the building code, we should talk about that as well. Uh, we have a building code that we call BBR. Uh, its American counterpart would be ASHRAE when it comes to energy. Uh, it's quite different from ASHRAE because we have we don't compare to a baseline. We have fixed um, limits on how much energy a new building can use. So it's not that detailed on how to get to that target. So you can use new innovations. You can try different ways to be energy efficient as long as you reach that overall goal. So that's what we call perform performance requirement. So you mean you, there are no detailed requirements on new values for windows and walls, etc. That's exactly right. We don't have a specific uh, mandatory requirement on windows. There is a requirement on U values for the whole building, uh, but that's a general value when you put everything together. So you can still try to, to do new things on every so part. So if you want, you can have a bit better window if you make the walls better. Yeah, you could. As long as you reach the target. Yes. And then we also have a mandatory very. Um, verification. That's also from an EU directive, that when you have your building up and running, and it's been running for about two years, then you have to verify that it's actually using that amount of energy that it was designed to do. 
So now you know a little bit more of the background. Mm -hmm. So Pia, please tell us about LEED in Sweden. Yes. We do very well in our LEED projects. Um, we actually score, 90% of our LEED projects score gold or better. In America, it's only 44%. And 25% of our LEED projects score platinum. In America, it's 6%. So I think we do very well when it comes to LEED in Sweden. Uh, we only worked with LEED since 2009. And we don't work only with LEED. We use BREEAM and we have a, our own Swedish system too. And even though we have 1.3 square feet, square feet certified LEED projects per Swede. So we're way above China and Germany, but still a bit less than America. But if we were to count BREEAM and other, other systems, we would probably be at the same level as America. Which are the highest scores, scoring buildings in Sweden? This is the highest scoring. It is built by Skanska, and we have a representative here if you want to know something more about it later on. Uh, this is called Vela Gård, and it scored 95 out of 110 points in LEED, which makes it one of the top 10 LEED buildings in the world. Vela Gård is in the south of Sweden, and it's built in the nature reserve. So you can see they have adapted the design to resemble a farmhouse. It's an old farmhouse just next to it. It's very, very energy efficient. It is actually a plus energy house. So it gets more energy out of it than it uses. Um, the other top scoring buildings in Sweden are, are these. I will tell you a bit more about at least one of them later. But you can see one common thing with all these, it's that they score very well in the energy and atmosphere section. Lots of them score almost all the points in energy and atmosphere. So that's one of the reasons for Sweden's success in LEED, I think. Here are four examples of LEED Platinum office buildings which I will tell you a bit more about. These first two ones, they are both Vasakronan buildings. Vasakronan is Sweden's largest commercial property owner and they have very high sustainability goals. Uh, tomorrow you can go and listen to their uh, sustainability manager at the same time in the LEED Around the World section. Um, they have decided to LEED certify all their buildings all their new buildings, all their renovations, and all their existing buildings. And they use lead volume for existing buildings, and they are the first company in the world to have a, what's it called again? Um, a, a green bond, but um, uh, E-bomb, um, what's it called? Uh, no, they have uh, pre-certified their lead prototype at gold level. So they're the only company in the world that's done that. Um, this first building is called Rosenborg and it's a new build. It's under construction, so we don't know the exactly points yet, but in energy and atmosphere it will score at least 26 points. And the other building is a renovation. Uh, that building originates from 1934, and it was originally a, a printing works. So it was office and printing presses in that building. And it's got the re restrictions, so you can't change the facade. And you can't, um, at least this facade, the other facade you can change a bit, so you can't put on so much more insulation. But still, as you can see, it will score very good in energy and atmosphere, 33 points. And the other two buildings are two Skanska buildings. Skanska is a big Swedish construction company, which we have exported to America, so they uh, work here too. Oh. And the first building is their head office, and it's a new construction. And I think it's the only building in the world that has three lead platinum certificates. It's got lead platinum for core and shell, and two 
lead platinum commercial imperials. One for Skanska's office and one for Nordea office. It's a big Swedish bank. Uh, and the other one I've already told you about, Vela Gård. Both of these are very, very energy efficient. As you can see, they score very good in energy and atmosphere. And Andrea Lindhagen has some other features too. They have a green roof and they have beehives on the roof. And it's also a, a, an activity-based office. So um, you don't have your own workplace. So when you come in the morning, you find a free space. And that also saves lots of energy. Because usually buildings are like half empty. Because not, not all people are there. Uh, we will hear a bit more about some of these later when Robin tells us. Okay. As you might know, there are often trade-offs between energy efficiency and uh, indoor environmental quality. Poor indoor environmental quality can cause health problems, but high energy use is costly and it affects the environment as a whole. So, how to build efficient but still have good indoor environmental quality? We are here because we have seen that Swedish products tend to score high in the lead credit, EAC1, which is about evaluating the building performance by doing energy modeling. What we see is that we perform reductions in primarily space heating, space cooling, and fan electricity. We have reductions in the other end uses as well, but these are the ones that stand out the most. Overall reductions are as large as 40 to 60 percent. And this gives us full score in the credit. And since this is a large number of points in the whole certification system, it's very important for the success for platinum building. But Robin, you talked about the whole chapter of energy and atmosphere. Uh, it looked like in PSLI that we score well and also the other credits. What about those? Well, uh, we also score high in those. For example, commissioning, measurement verification, and green power. One of the keys to successful building is to look at, look at it as one system. Here we have some of the important parts that we'll tell you more about. For example, we have the building envelope centralized air handling units, distribution systems. In the rooms, we have room units, for example, radiators or chilled beams. Finally, we have automation systems that binds them together. The building envelope has to be both well insulated as well as airtight. As you might know, this is not rocket science, but it's still very important. It's the first, it's the start of how to reduce your energy use. Today we also use a lot of glass in our buildings. It's nice and it gives good views, uh, but it increases both heat losses and cooling demand. But as you can see in this example of Rosenborg, which uh, scored platinum, you can still have a fair amount of glass, but have platinum anyway. In order to reduce cooling loads, it's, a good, it's important to handle solar gains in a way that still provides good daylight. And this can be done by having high-performance glazing or internal or ex external shading devices or combinations of all of them, which is kind of common and very good. Also, when you work with the building envelope design, you have to think about the thermal comfort for the occupants that will work there. How do you make sure that you actually get good thermal comfort? Thank you for asking, Maria. <laughs> uh, we do simulation models of the thermal comfort. We usually use the same softwares as we do with our energy modeling. Okay. 
So we're quite sure we do OK. There are different ways to transfer heating and cooling in a building. We seldom use air to transfer heat. Sometimes we use it for cooling when we have very little cooling loads in the building. But as soon as we say we have a, like a cooling demand, we will use other ways. And this is for offices, of course. Yes, thank you. <laughs> this is for offices. Our designed airflows are only for outdoor air rates, for ventilation. Uh, and instead of using air, we use water to carry the heating and the cooling. And in the rooms, we have room units. Like, for example, you can see here on the screen, we have heat convectors or radiators placed below windows in order to give better comfort for people who sit close to the windows. And in the ceiling, we have chilled beams, which I realize now it's not so common here in the US, but in offices in Sweden, it's very, very common. So we generally also score good on IAQ1 and uh, ventilation rates. Since yes. We use, yeah. yes, that's right. So why use hydronic systems? First of all, it's way more efficient to transfer energy by water than by air. It also gives better comfort. For, as I mentioned, for you can have radiators, blow windows, but also you don't have to have these large air flows that hits you in the face or in the back or anyway. Um, and also you can reduce you can reduce the ducts. So you don't have to have those tall rooms. The height of the room can be reduced. And then you save money. As Pia mentioned, we have high airflow rates. That's because the Swedish building regulations are more stringent than ASHRAE when it comes to ventilation. We also have 100% outdoor air often. This could mean that heat losses will increase if you don't take measures. So what we do is we use energy recovery efficient fans, and demand control ventilation. In particular, uh, heat recovery is very important. As you can see, can everyone see here? Is that pic the white picture ah, there in, at yeah. the bottom? Okay, let's keep it. Uh, we have the outdoor air, minus 18 degrees in this example. We have the return air for the, from the rooms, 22 degrees. And we heat it changed so that we save heat and get 14 degrees out that we can supply to the room. So we only have to, to put in a little bit of heat in order to have a good room temperature. Typically, we have like 19, 20 degrees in supply air temperatures. And this is used in all new construction projects in Sweden today, with efficiencies as high as 80% or above. Now I've talked about how to reduce the use of energy. But it's also important to look at the sources of heating and cooling. In Sweden, we primarily have two options for commercial buildings. It's district heating and ground source heat pumps. For cooling, instead of only using traditional chillers, we also have district cooling and ground source cooling, what we in Sweden call free cooling. And a combination of these cooling sources are also common. In uh, these two examples, Vallagord, we have ground source heating and cooling. And in Clara C, we have district heating with chillers. 
I've been talking about district heating and cooling as it's obvious to you, but uh, what is it really? Pia, could you give us a walkthrough? Yes, it's an important communist invention. <laughs> no, just joking. It's a very efficient way to take care of all, all the heat you have in your society. So um, we use it, we use it, we have different fuels, but uh, most common are biofuels. We have lots of forests and we get lots of forest residue that we can use, like all the branches of the trees when we cut down them, we use for biofuels. And we have, I don't know, in America it's not allowed as, as in lead, you can't use it for renewable, but uh, in Sweden you can, then it's called biofuels. And the other thing we use is our garbage. As Maria said, we're good at recycling, but the things you can't recycle, we burn them, incinerate them, but then we take care of the heat. So we have big boilers, CHP boilers. So the garbage is burnt and we get energy and electricity. And with energy, we warm our buildings. The district energy systems are very, very big. They cover whole cities, many, many miles of pipes. But Pia, I heard that it's bad for the environment to incinerate garbage. Yes, of course, it's not the best thing you can do. It's best is to recycle. But we clean the smoke gases. Uh, the European community, they have laws regarding incinerations and they're very strict. So you clean the, clean the smoke gases. So I think it's a better thing than just put it on a dump. And better than just burn it without taking care of the heat. Uh, as I said, the fuels, biofuels and garbage are, is, are the most common, but it depends on which city you're in. Because in some cities you might have a big industry that got lots of waste heat. If they do, we connect it to the district heating and use it to warm our buildings. So it's sort of, you see what's available and you use it to warm the buildings. So very good systems, I think. Maybe a bit communistic, I'm not sure, but uh, I hope you can do it in here in America too. We export it to China too. So they look at us and see how we solve things. Not just district heating, but how to take care of the sewage and make a, um, gas of it and run your buses on it, etc. But we will talk on that some other day at some other uh, green build. Um, we have district cooling too, and those systems are also citywide, very large. But I'm not an expert on them, so I will leave that to Maria. Thank you. Yes, to get a very energy efficient building, you should use free cooling as much as you can. And there are many ways of doing that. Um, for example, you can use the outer air. Uh, that's when you have a co cooling load, cooling demand inside your building, but it's still cold enough outside to use that air. So in Sweden, since we have 100% outer air, we get that free cooling from ventilation uh, sort of automatically. But we can also use the outer air to cool down our hyd hydronic systems. Since Robin told you, we don't have so big air flows like you have here in the US, but we can still um, use the outer air quite a lot for free cooling. And we're trying to have as high temperature as possible in our cooling system, because that means that we can use the outer air for a longer time period of the year to cool it down. Another way is to use a ground source free cooling. Um, the most common way is to have boreholes with heat pumps, like Robin told us. And we have one example here, the Antria Lindhagen, the Skanska project. And they have their own patented solution called deep green cooling. And it's very energy efficient. They don't even have a regular heat pump. So it's almost, um, it's free cooling almost the only thing that they get there. Um, you can also use water bodies for free cooling. It could be a lake or the sea that you use to cool down your cooling system. And it can also be an aquifer, like we have in this project with Rosenborg. An aquifer is sort of an underground lake. And that's something that you, you have to have it on your site. You, you don't build it. So if you're lucky, you have one where you're building your project. 
Um, and you can use that sort of the same way as boreholes. You can actually have seasonable storage. You can use it for both heating and cooling, depending on the season. And as you see on the picture, you can have, in, in an aquifer, you can have a, a warm side and a cool side. So that's very energy efficient. Um, but if you don't have an aquifer or a lake nearby, you can't use any of those options. We have, as Pia told, told us, the district cooling. And that's like the district heating system. It's a city-wide system, very big. And it depends on what city you're in, what energy sources they have. Uh, but they, most cities have some kind of free cooling. They use the sea, and they get um, some free cooling from the other side of the district heating. You get some free cooling from the heat pumps there. Uh, but it's, the most common is that you also have big chillers in the district uh, cooling system. But since it's such a large system, it's very energy efficient. So it's much more efficient than having shillers in every separate building. Some cities have snow. So you, they save the snow in the winter and cover it with uh, um, things to keep it cold and uses it for district cooling in the summer. Yes. So there are many options. Uh, but now you heard of um, our efficient systems. But Robin, how do we make them work? Well. Even if all parts in the system are super energy efficient, the out outcome will not be so good if they don't work properly together. So they, we have to have automation systems that are intelligent. For example, you have to prevent heating and cooling from occurring at the same time in a room. It's all about communication between the systems. And this is also very important in order to have successful demand control. For example, if you have like CO2 sensors in the room that detect when people enter and leave, I know you all know about this, but you have to have a system that actually controls how this works. So it can send a signal to the ventilation system, say now we need more air. It's like uh, we showed Skanska Centre Lindhagen, the activity-based office. When there are only a few there, the systems won't go on full. But exactly. they will lower the... Um, and also, uh, you need to monitor and measure the energy in the building and also other parameters like temperatures or heating and cooling loads at different hours and store these in a system, like the building automation system, so that the operation personnel can enter it either online, look at the building online, or go offline, go back in time and try to find errors. And it's also very important in order to have a successful measurement and verification program that you actually can follow up your building in a good way. In, uh, in Vasakronen, as I told you about before, uh, one of our big property owners. The operation personnel, they have, uh, they have the system on their phone. So they can take up their phone and see how much energy was used the last day or compare all over the year or whatever. And they can change the settings with, just with their phone. Yes, that's a very good tool to have. We were uh, quite... Uh, in our hotel here in... New Orleans, they cool the air, and, if it, and we think it's a bit too cold, so we turn it up, and then they heat it in the same. That's not good automation. <laughs> no, we might mention that uh, we, don't, we don't use reheat. I mean, if we cool down there, we will use it. Don't reheat it again. Uh, to wrap this up, we will look at a case study of Andrea Lindhagen to get you some numbers. Andrea Lindhagen, as Pia told you about, scored 33 out of 37 points in the energy and atmosphere chapter. And first of all, we have heat recovery, 79%. This means that very little heat is used to warm up the outdoor air. So we can have good indoor air quality, I don't but, not, know but don't pay for it. 
Did you mention that we never recirculate air? No, we didn't. We mentioned that we have 100% air, but we, we don't usually recirculate air. That's right. Also, we have energy efficient fans that are in this building is about 20% lower than the Swedish building code and even lower than ASHRAE. And the wind envelope for this building is also very good. As you can see in, on the screen, we have uh, U values for roof, walls, and windows. U value is a measure of how much heat there is lost through the envelope. Uh, and roof, compared to Ashley, 30% lower. Walls, 42. And windows, between 40 and 60%, depending we have different windows in different parts of the building. Well, the building energy use has been lowered successfully by the building designers. But still, the building is also using good sources. It's connected to one of Stockholm's uh, district heating networks that has more than 80% renewable sources. And it's also using deep, uh, well, deep green cooling, the ground source technique. That's very efficient. It doesn't use any chillers. So we only, we only pay for the pump electricity to carry the water into your cooling system. And I guess you wonder how, what's the energy score in percent? Well, it's 62% compared to the ASHRAE baseline in reductions, which is quite large, I would say. So. I hope you've learned something about Swedish design in LEED. But what has Sweden learned from LEED? There must be something. <laughs> Pia, please. Not so much energy-wise, as you understand. We hope to learn you a bit about the energy. I think that's one of the great things with LEED, that, that different countries that are good at different things now have the ability to show it. Because you can, you can go into USGBC's homepage and you can find these buildings and you can see the energy score and lead, uh, read a little description of the, of the building. So I think that's one of the really best things with LEED. So we haven't learned so much when it comes to energy, but we have learned some other things. Uh, green roofs, for instance. We soon found out that if you have a city project, with not so much uh, sight on it, in an area with lots of other buildings. Then you can score up to 11 points in lead by adding a green roof. So of course, we have green roofs on all, almost all lead projects when, it's, when, it's, um, when you can do it. So a lead has led to more green roofs. And also, if you want to score all the points for a green roof, you need to have them more biodiverse, so more species on the roof. So we have uh, developed our green roofs to be more good for insects and like for bees. So it's not uncommon that we put beehives on that too. We have a company in Stockholm that you can rent beehives from and they take care of them. That, I think, is very good. And when it comes to water, we maybe we haven't been so good with water in Sweden because we have an abundance of water. We don't sort of need to save water so very much. So therefore, our lavatory faucets haven't been so good. Since we started working with LEED, we have lowered the flow of the, of the lavatory faucets by half. So nowadays, they're double better than before we started working with LEED. But we still can't reach the baseline, actually, for laboratory faucets. And I think it's because our pressure is lower. So if we use 0 0.5 gallons per minute, as LEED says, you won't get your hands so very clean. But Pia, how, if we don't reach the prerequisite, the baseline, how do we have a LEED certification? Yeah, it was really difficult in the first projects. 
that was the most difficult thing in all of league was the water prerequisite. But fortunately, our toilets are better than yours. <laughs> They're, um, in an office building, they usually have half the flow of, of the ASHRAE baseline. So we were saved by the toilets. <laughs> but it's good, though, that, we have, uh, that our laboratory faucets has become better. Because actually, it's better. Be before, when you turn the tap, you actually got sprayed <laughs> because we had such a high flow. Now it's actually much better. But you have to be careful with saving water too. Because if you save too much, the maintenance personnel, they need to go and flush all the pipes. So uh, good to save water, but to the right amount. Otherwise, water will be used anyway, but by someone else. Um, when it comes to green cars, that's no, nothing that's new for Sweden. But before LEED, we never had any preferred parkings for green cars. And I think that's a good thing, because it advertises the building as a green building. And since you get the points for electric charging stations, of course we have electric charging stations on our lead projects, and that's good too. Um, green power. Our power in Sweden, our electric power, is not based on coal like in America. It's like... 50% of the power comes from water power. And the next largest bit is nuclear power. And after that is wind power and CHPs from the district heating. So uh, our power is quite green, lots of water power. But if we want to score in lead projects, we're not allowed to use the water power since it's very large scale water power. So therefore, lead projects has promoted wind power. Almost all Swedish lead projects that score green power use wind power in Sweden. And when it comes to materials, we have a long tradition of product disclosure. And we have a long tradition of uh, avoidance of hazardous materials. So we're very glad that USGBC listened to us and put that into the version 4 criteria. It was actually when we had a meeting in Paris, we said, why don't you have all these things in materials? And uh, next time when we looked at the draft for version 4, they had put it in. So thanks, USGBC. Uh, but we focus very much on these things. So we haven't looked at all so much at uh, um, renewable content or recycled content or regional materials. So I think that is really good. And in version 4, when we have LCA, that's also good, because we're not so good in that area yet. And another thing that I think is very good with League that it sort of changes the market. Because before it was just the sustainability managers that wanted to certify buildings, but now it's the business people. And I think LEED has a importance because of that, because it, um, business people like LEED better than the Swedish, which is called Milieu, Bygnat, environmental building. So I think that's really good. And also that it changes our perspectives and lets us look at new things. That's what I think we have learned from LEED. It's time to sum up and give you the dummy guide that we put together. So these are what we think the most important things. Uh, set goals. Yes. If you want to have a good result, you need to set goals. You can set a goal for platinum. And you should have very high goals when it comes to energy efficiency, if you want to have a good energy efficient building. And after that, you have to get all involved. Yeah, otherwise it won't work. You have to get everyone around the table, the building owner, the architect, the engineer, the contractor, and if possible, the tenant. So everyone works together to reach that goal. Architects and engineers, they usually just nag on each other. 
Oh, the engineer said, oh, they just draw, they just glass buildings, and then the, and the architect said, oh, well, you just want to have, you don't want to have any, build, any windows at all. But if everyone works together, that's when you get a good result. Yes, and then you need to follow up on those goals that you have set uh, through the whole design. Yeah, if you have set goals, that's good. But if you don't follow up, it won't work. So you need to follow up not only through design, but through construction. And also when the building is there and up and running, you need to follow up. And for the building, you need to have a well-insulated envelope. Yes, the most important thing for energy efficiency is to reduce the demand. And how do you re reduce the demand? Well, you use a well-insulated envelope, of course. Yes, and then of course it has to be airtight as well. Yeah. Because if it's well insulated but not airtight, then it won't work. So airtight and well insulated. And for airtightness, we usually we do tests and we do them. We start when they start working, so we can see that they, the workers use the right methods. Mm. So several airtightness tests test if you want to have a really good result. And then heat recovery. Yes, we need to have good heat recovery, especially in the ventilation system, as Robin told you. Uh, you don't want that, all that energy that you put into heating the ventilation area. You don't want that to fire up the chimney. You want to recover it. So you choose a very energy efficient heat recovery. And in Sweden, rotary heat recoveries are most common. And you should have at least 80% heat recovery. Energy efficient equipment. Yes, everything that you put into the building, like the fans, the elevators, the circular pumps, the lighting, everything should be as energy efficient as it could, of course. And sometimes that means a little bit bigger investment, uh, because that could be more expensive. But most of the time that pays off very quickly. And you can use a life cycle calculation to see what it costs, um, really, in a few years. Renewable energy. Yes, when you have this very energy efficient building, after you have made it as energy efficient as possible, then you're choosing what energy sources uh, you should have. And of course, it should be renewable energy, uh, both on-site and off-site. In Sweden, we had district heating, very common, and different kinds of free cooling for the building. And for electricity, uh, we use a lot of wind power to score well in lead. Uh, and we also try to have solar energy on site for the building projects. Mm. What sort of solar energy do we use? For office buildings, uh, we have the ones for electricity, mm. uh, because that's the TV. biggest demand is for electricity. Mm. It's only if you have a, a gym or something that needs a lot of ho hot water that you use uh, the other one, which yeah, I can't remember what it's called. Thermal. Thermal, yeah. Intelligent automation and monitoring. Yes, that's to get the whole building working together as one system, so the system doesn't work against each other. So you need an intelligent automation system, and you want an automation system that could monitor and submeter, so you can follow up on different parts of, of the building. Yeah, and then we come to commissioning and measurement and verification. Yeah, finally, uh, you may have to make sure that the building actually works as it was intended. And I think we have mentioned that many times. Uh, you need to have commissioning during both design and construction, and then to follow up, and measure, and verify. And it's very important to get the operational personnel to get to understand the building, so they're able to follow up and see if there's anything going wrong. So they can correct that and make the building work as it was intended. Uh, but when you have your building up there and you think it works fine, that's not the end of the story, because you want to have an energy efficient building the whole life cycle of the building. Uh, so you have to keep monitoring and keep submetering. So keep up the good work with your building and you'll have an energy efficient building. Well, thank you everyone for coming and listening to us. It's been a real pleasure. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. <laughs> if you wanna learn more from Sweden, you should uh, visit our two sessions tomorrow. Our colleagues will present at uh, 8 o'clock, lead around the world. 
and uh, 9.30, lessons learned. Go see them. There will be great presentations. And if well, you have any questions now, just free to ask. Yes, please ask. I'm at Bogus from uh, Syracuse University. So first, that was a platinum presentation. It was really <laughs> Thank, <good>. you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the 100% outside air in, in most buildings. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of questions here. I'm just going to ask about demand control. So what sensors are sensing the demand, and uh, is there a need for recalibration? Well, we, we usually have constant volume systems in offices. Uh, we have both constant volume and VAV systems. Yeah, VAV systems are usually for meeting rooms or conference halls. Or like Andre Lindhagen. Yes. Right. And then you have CO2 and he heat. So temperature and CO2 is what they usually regulate the VAV system on. But also manual buttons for occupants that enter the room. And it's very common that you have also time schedule. So you can have those CO2 mm -hmm. and temperature, but then you also the building turns down itself a certain time when it thinks that people have gone home. But if there's someone there, it will notice that you're there, that someone is moving. Hi, I'm Christianis from Boulder Associates Architects. I noticed some really low U values for the glazing. I'm wondering if you could tell us what the common construction is. The U values for windows is a common energy efficient window is around one uh, in our, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you can even metrics. get below that. So if you have a very energy efficient, you can get below one. And that's watts per square meter in Kelvin. Your U values are about half what ours are for our typical windows. I'm just wondering, are you doing triple glazing? Are you doing extra coatings? What yes. are you doing to it? We have um, gases between the, the windows, of course, and we have coatings on them. And we have sometimes triple glazing, sometimes double glazing, and some times quadruple glazing. You must also, it's important to mention that 1.0 watts per square meter is for the hole with the frame and the thermal joints, not just the glass, since the glass can be as best as 0.5 today, even if it's very expensive. Though. Yeah, and in, when we have big glass offices, sometimes we have double facades too. So two for saints. District, yeah. Yeah, how long the district heating systems have been in place? I'm not quite sure, actually. But it's, I think, since at least the 1970s. Because before that, we had oil burners. In, in buildings, but then there was an oil crisis, and we said we this can't go on. So then we changed to district heating, and for a while we had a lot of electrical heating too. But in the in the cities, it's district heating, and the electric heating in the countryside has changed to heat pumps now. In the beginning, we also had the, the, we didn't produce electricity when we had district heating, because we had a lot of forest residues mm. that we burn for heating in small stations or district heating systems. But then the electricity prices went up, so it was a good investment to invest in a... CHP? Yeah, to in make generator. Yeah. Hmm? How do you deal with operator error, like when you design these beautiful buildings, and then I know that you monitor, but what do you do with the transition manuals, working with facilities, staff? How do you make sure that people are operating with buildings It depends, of course. Uh, she asked how we make sure they operate the building correctly. Of course, it differs. We have some property owners that are not so good, but we have several like Vasa Kronan that are really good. And they uh, first they um, 
they hire the right persons with the right knowledge and then they keep them educated and they have persons in the buildings that know the building and we have like if if you know if you don't like something you send in a complaint and they deal with it and the management they check all these complaints that they have been taken care of i was with one of the um managers like a one of the higher managers and and then he got a message on his phone and then it was because uh, the the te technician hadn't done what he was supposed to then he got the message on the phone so and if he hadn't done it it would go up to the next boss so i think good good facility management just and then always um, the designers the hvac designers they of course they are, they give instructions on how the buildings are working. Hmm? Uh, Dave Dye, Grand Rapids Community College. You have all this hydronic heating, okay, mm -hmm. and you have these cities that have, or, that have this water that they can heat for the rest of the city, but what about if you have a facility that's out in the country and you have hydronic heating? How do you heat that water? Well, uh, if we go back in time, a lot of people used uh, oil burn, yeah, right. electricity, or um, lots of. Uh, we have lots of uh, small uh, boilers for uh, biofuels uh, too, of course, since we got lots of forest. Yeah, pellet burners. Mm -hmm. Oh, so That's, you may heat that with pellet burners. You think you yeah. avoid the oil and gas? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pellet burners are common in houses, uh, mm -hmm. but not in commercial buildings because they are often in the cities where there are restrictions of. Uh, of pollution. Of pollution. Mm. But what's the competing source to district heating is ground source heat pumps that oh, many okay. houses use, but also mm. commercial buildings. Ground source and also outdoor air heat pumps, that outdoor air to water heat pumps. Okay. And solar is coming a bit too, mostly for uh, homes. Yeah, for hot water in the summers. Mm. Because if you, have a, if you have a pellets burner in your home, you don't want to fire it up all during the summer. Then you can have solar in the summer. And, and get the electricity for the heat. Uh, no, then you get hot water oh, for hot the water. shower right. and things. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. And in the winter, you use the pellets. Okay. But that's for small houses. As we said, offices, heat pumps. Okay. Which use water, is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. Thank you. Yes? What do you mean by geothermal? It's a load for you to put the coolant deep into the ground, so in winter you take advantage of the constant temperature on your ground to help warm your air, and similarly in the summer. Yeah, that's what we mean when we say boreholes. That is exactly what we mean. Uh, with the, and most of the time it's come with a heat pump. But we usually don't put down the refrigerant, we put down something else. <laughs> so to avoid like refrigerant going up to the air. So that's one of the most common ways, yes. Low Low humid humidity, yes, because we have uh, cool seasons. The humidity goes down in, in winter time. Uh, we don't do anything. No, we don't. Uh, we don't actually do anything <laughs> with the uh, humidity. Uh, we just use the air as it is, and that's most of the time. That's that's convenient as it is. Yeah. Sometimes there are problems, but then they can choose. Maybe they shouldn't warm the air as much. Or, or they adjust something, but uh, usually no problems. No, it's just the energy. Uh, the, he asked about um, the heat recovery, the rotary recovery. If it's if any humidity, it's passed through that, but it's mostly energy that transmitted there. So we have. Uh, We've uh, seen that in America they talk about mold in the systems. That's something we're very uncommon with. Yes. 
this, if we have op operable windows, this is a really fun question because I do lots of teachings. And architects, they want operable windows. <laughs> Engineers, they don't want them. <laughs> People just mess up the system and they will let out all the, all the air and yeah. So some have and some haven't. If, if the engineers choose, uh, they won't be operable. But, but in all our homes, you can open the windows. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have more questions, you can stay and talk to us or hmm? we'll get a business card or you can write down the email address and just ask any questions later on as well. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.